Hi, I'm Yulia, and this is Red Lines, a show where we dive into some very daring subjects and cross some red lines of political conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about what happens if Russia wins, or rather succeeds, and what happens if Trump succeeds in America. Today with me, I have Operator Starsky and Jonathan Fink from Silicon Curtain. Well, good to Great. see you back here. <laughs> As we were saying, the world is chaos. The world is chaos, and every day brings a new stream of, well, you know, extra dollops, extra layers of chaos. But I think this is part of the problem. To see it as disconnected chaos is very much the narrative you see in the media. But there are connections. Yeah. There are real connections between the chaos. Russia is well aware of what's happening in the Middle East well aware of the impact of that, both on the news cycle, but also on the fact that all this violence distracts us from seeing the strategic intentions behind it. And chaos is not just chaos. You know, there's there's chaos and there's pizdiets. And only Russians know how to, to do that at its full depths of kind of depravity and chaos. It's a Russian art form. Yeah, it's organized chaos. It's I think this is the best uh, description of organized chaos, and that's basically Russia um, cor coordinating and correlating events in the world so that they would bounce off of each other, and so disasters become bigger. Um, we recently received the news that obviously Biden is not attending Rammstein because he, well, there is, I don't know if you've recently seen Florida on your TikTok feed or really anywhere, but it's, uh, it's not looking great over there. I personally am flooded, pun intended, with uh, a lot of videos from Florida because I'm currently in the, uh, you know, in North America and uh, it looks awful. So I do understand his choice to not go, but it looks like Rammstein is not happening at all because Biden is not going because he was the focal point of this Rammstein. It was going to be his first and last Rammstein meeting. So what do we think? How do, what do you guys think it, uh, about how it's going to affect, um, well, the already, you know, quite, as you've said, Pizdiat situation that's happening around us? Oh, my God. Uh, well, from here, from Europe, uh, one thing that everybody clearly understands is that uh, we should learn how to uh, work and continue fighting uh, without the help of our main allies, maybe uniting smaller countries, maybe making other alliances. Not talking about exit in NATO, of course, but I'm talking about uh, stronger cooperation within the alliance because um, there are rumors already that uh, in case of uh, specific results of the elections in the United States, uh, Europe will have to think how to, uh, you know, uh, stay on its own and uh, defend itself, uh, you know, on its own. That's why uh, we should think more in this direction, of course. But uh, generally, I believe that uh, the main thing is that we should uh, work with whoever we have, as my sergeant major back in the days in my brigade, uh, when I nagged to him that that soldier is drinking, that soldier is not disciplined, can we just, you know, remove them? And he said, uh, no, man, you have to work with whoever you have and you have to find approach. And uh, probably there is some other kind of problem. And the problem here is the lack of motivation, the lack of dedication and the lack of understanding that we are dealing with an enemy that is already fighting, that uh, has uh, no hesitation of crossing red lines. And uh, we must understand that we have to uh, defend ourselves uh, until, you know, until the politicians start thinking this way, until st they start uh, thinking that one, in order to defeat Russia, we must bomb Russia. It's time to bomb Moscow. And two, we have to be dedicated and united until it happens. 
uh, we will have PSDs and total bezlot. Uh, other than that, like nothing's gonna change. It's it all depends on the motivation of uh, key decision makers. It's also interesting because I don't think the world actually, or like I guess key uh, key uh, lawmakers in the world don't necessarily think about the fact that even uh, or Americans for that instance, that if Trump becomes president, that's not just a problem for Ukraine, for Ukraine cutting off aid, right? Because if Trump becomes president, that's a problem for the entire Western world. If Trump cuts off aid to Ukraine and goes against all of the allies, then that's an issue within the alliance. And that's two forces against each other in the alliance. That's no longer an alliance. There is a big issue within that alliance. Trump wants to exit NATO, right? He said that in his first presidency, and I doubt that his approach is going to be different in his second presidency. That means that the United States at that point is going to be an adversary to NATO, not an ally. Not, not part of NATO. That creates a very huge problem for the world order, which is something no one seems to be like even thinking about. It came out recently now with proof, like we of course know that Trump has been on the phone with, uh, with Putin, you know, 24 seven, cause they're buddies uh, for the longest time. But now we have proof of that because th there has been a leak from that. Now we have Trump's wife, who is supposed to be the first lady, who wrote a book disagreeing with absolute core fundamentals of his election campaign. It's not even chaos. It's just, it's, I can't even call it organized chaos. It's just everything is imploding on itself. And it's going to only get worse if this is the outcome of this election. And I find it interesting because we, of course, this channel is about Ukraine and we talk about it uh, in terms of Ukraine. But I think for the Americans listening, the, listening to this, right, because there are, of course, a lot, it's, it affects you too. And it affects you much more than it affects Ukraine. And Ukraine not being able to defeat Russia affects you more than you want to know that it affects you. I think, you know, jumping in on that one, and this is a key point, I think. Um, I mean, first of all, there's a character who is probably not in heaven. He's probably in the other place, but he's got a big grin on his face. And that's Yuri Bizmenov who described, you know, Russian strategy. It's divide and conquer. It's the same as it ever was. The reason why the Cold War wasn't won by Russia is they weren't capable of dividing us. The stories they were telling weren't compelling enough. The aggression was something that we could see through and we were willing to provide uh, an equal and in cases superior defense, uh, um, uh, deterrent defense against that. Somehow, the stories, the lies of Putin's regime are compelling enough to siphon off big portions of population in the US especially, but also in other countries as well through self-interest or whether they find these stories beneficial to their own motivations or whether they actually believe them. Um, it's effective in a way the Soviet Union never, never was. I mean, they're always... Um, useful idiots. They're always agents. They're always assets. They're always people, you know, willing to take, let's say, a hard left agenda in order to support the Soviet Union. But now they've been able to pull this trick and get both hard left and hard right and experts and people in between and all sorts of different sort of shades of opinion to 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 basically um, distrust each other and to erode the kind of institutions which previously would have helped to keep, uh, you know, Russian BS and Pizdiets uh, on the other side of the border. And this is why I call Silicon Curtain, Silicon Curtain, because we had a big iron curtain to keep the Pizdiets out. Now it's in every single device that contains a silicon chip. It's Pizdiets pipe straight into your home, straight into the loo when you're sitting there with your iPhone, unfortunately. Yeah, and it doesn't stop. It only gets better, right? I think uh, another another point, uh, sort of piggybacking off of this, you said that this is the same strategy they've had all the time. Um, you, I found out today, actually, through a conversation with someone I'm visiting here in Canada, that they only recently found out facts about Catherine the Great, right? Which we in Ukraine simply call Catherine the Second because she's never going to be the Great. She's not great. She was awful, and she uh, is the second reason uh, to the existence of Russia, the stolen, you know, the stolen valor. But what she did is when she couldn't conquer Cossacks, which were these great Ukrainian warriors, 
um, she divided them. She divided and conquered them. What She used the same strategies in conquering Cossacks as Russia is trying to use with the Western world in Ukraine today. She would start rumors. She would start infighting between them. And that's how they ended up succumbing into the Russian Empire, because you conquer from within when you can't conquer from outside. And we're seeing this happen today and seeing it happen more than ever. I um, I didn't even realize how much it was happening in the West because, uh, and I've said this, I think, last time uh, on Red Lines in a different conversation, is that I... I was in Ukraine for 10 months. Obviously, my information space is mostly uh, English speaking because that's what I'm interested in. But I didn't get nearly as much of a flood of random unrelated things uh, that are related to Ukraine as I did when I came here because I'm back here. I'm back in this algorithm, right? We are now in America somehow blaming Ukraine for FEMA not adequately responding to Hurricane Helene. We are now in America not educated enough to understand that tanks manufactured in the 70s have nothing to do with the budget that FEMA has to battle and respond to a hurricane. We also somehow in America forgot that Hurricane Sandy uh, that I was in the middle of in 2012 in New York that devastated mostly New Jersey and Brooklyn had one of the most terrible responses from FEMA, where there were flashlights, sandwiches, and blankets being given out with a budget of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to deal with. We also forgot that Katrina in 2005 was a similarly horrendous response and resulted in 1,800 deaths that could have been prevented if our government knew how to uh, adequately react to disasters. So this this information or disinformation space at this point is brewing like a hurricane and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and at this point these unrelated issues and in in our case it's ukraine right but also other countries are being taken as bargaining chips for the narratives that are useful for the politicians who want to ruin us and we're falling for them and it's crazy you know, maybe uh, people will have to learn uh, about it the hard way, like uh, we did in Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, unfortunately, we learned a lot of things the hard way. Uh, after the revolution, and, and the reason the revolution started is because uh, people voted for, for uh, people that were not supposed to rule Ukraine, right? And... Um, like, yes, a lot of viewers will say, come on, you're doubting democracy. That was people's choice. Well, yeah, it was people's choice and they learned the hard way uh, how to make right choice, right? And um, maybe people have to learn the hard way. Maybe, uh, you know, whatever the Russia does now and if Russia succeeds, it will prolong it's uh, agony, I think. Uh, it will prolong it by several years, but uh, in the end, uh, the biggest Russian advantage that uh, they have over the democratic societies is their own uh, downside as well. Because Russia is driven by violence. Every uh, action, every strategy they have, it's uh, driven by violence. And uh, on the West, people, even though there's plenty of violence on the West, but generally in our mindset, in our culture, we are absolutely different and our decisions are not driven by violence. They're driven by different other things, uh, progress, emotions, discovery, like many things. There's like whole uh, Maslow's pyramid there. But in Russia, it's literally violence. Why is it like that? It's because Russia is uh, breeding the society of uh, sociopaths where you are either a victim or you uh, continue this violence that is uh, thrown at you by your elites downwards or outside and you're stuck in this uh, circle of victimism. The only way to exit it is through becoming an aggressor. And then this goes over and over again. On the West, it, there's a completely different picture. People here are absolutely different. And uh, 
whatever happens in Russia, even though it may seem like, you know, their biggest strength, their biggest skill, but uh, generally it's their biggest disadvantage that people in the West uh, have uh, overcame many, many decades or maybe centuries ago. We learned how to progress, but uh, we also forgot uh, how to defend against uh, forces like that, against lies. Maybe it, maybe it's because of the evolution, because the, the Cold War itself, um, it, uh, I cannot say that it ended, it evolved. It evolved into a hybrid warfare. And uh, we don't know how to how to uh, defend against it, how to find a proper solution. But we will, but we will, because uh, we have a lot of uh, bright minds, we have a lot of decent people. And you know, one thing that uh, whatever happens out there in the media, one thing that keeps motivating me is that uh, when I open the commentaries and I see all those amazing people supporting my country and supporting democracy and uh, supporting freedom in the world, even though they're not soldiers, but they have different mindset. And this mindset is doomed to win. That's just my opinion. And um, I mean, to jump in there, um... I, I, I got all sorts of simplistic ideas to try and explain what uh, Andrew is talking about there, you know, the implicit violence. But I think one of the fundamentals, and of course there's lots and lots of detail in history that layer onto this, but Russia is a pre-industrial mindset, which means that if you want wealth, if you want luxury, if you want power and status, you come at it with a mindset that the planet, the earth, that nature can only produce a limited amount of wealth. You have to fight over it if you want to have a part of it. The pie is only so big and the pie does not grow. There's no way to grow the pie. It's pre-industrial in that sense. Um, whereas Ukraine, of course, uh, has many centuries of a different experience, but also the Industrial Revolution, when it came, it came to Ukraine. It didn't really come to Russia, or at least Ukraine was the motor of the Industrial Revolution. That creates another completely different mindset from the agricultural revolution through to the industrial. And that is that you can multiply wealth through building bonds of trust and cooperation and legal frameworks. Russia doesn't possess any of this stuff. And that in part is why the violence is, is perpetuated. Yeah, Russia, as, as much as it wants to seem like it's at the beacon of progress or it's the beacon of culture, has always been on the tail end of progress and really hasn't been evolving much. And if we look at their, you know, their mentality at the fact of at, at the fact that it's so difficult for them to even separate themselves from this like, you know, king and his servants type of mentality. It's like it's never changed. But I want to uh, jump back a little bit to what Starsky said about, you know, the mentalities that win. And I agree with you. But my only concern here is that, yes, Ukraine learned in our mistakes, but Ukraine is not a world dominating power like the U.S. is. And Ukraine learning on our mistakes costs Ukraine. Right. And like sort of echoes to the world. The U.S. learning on its own mistakes costs the entire world. And really like Trump winning and Trump going with Russia and Trump letting, you know, a lot of terrible things happen would not just be a learning experience for American people. <clears throat> I also would like to say that, you know, American people uh, are seriously not learning because I'm seeing so many influencers and genuinely like random people stay in Florida so they could record TikToks about being hit by a hurricane in a zone A evacuation level. And I am just like, is this the matrix, you know? <laughs> because it's like your, your hundred dollars that you're gonna make off of that million views is really not worth your life, genuinely. Please stop bringing your kids to Disney World in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, but, um, but that's besides the point. It's crazy to see that this world dominating power that holds so much, that holds so much like, no, I, I don't wanna call it a bargaining chip, but that holds so much say in how the rest of the world turns out is kind of right now populated by this crazy, like far right ideology and these crazy gullible people that believe anything that, that, you know, TikTok throws at them, that we can be 
we as the whole world, because it's not just going to affect Russia or China or the U.S., it's going to affect absolutely everyone because the U.S. has ties to absolutely everyone. And, you know, it kind of like is part of a narrative absolutely everywhere. It's it, the U.S. having a fascist leaning president and a far right president is going to be a disaster for the rest of the world and for the U.S. So I think I it's, agree it's with you. slightly worse, uh, just a tiny bit than... I, <laughs> I agree with you. It, it's worse, it's bad, uh, it's awful, but uh, sometimes it's necessary. And uh, sometimes it's something that cannot be avoided. Um, again, that, that's just my opinion. Um, Jonathan, what do you think about it? I think I go back to my... Uh, I think everyone fixates on... The aspect of democracy, which is voting people in. Uh, but that's not the bit that causes the long term damage. That causes short term damage. You know, for all those people who say, oh my goodness, but Harris isn't great. Okay, Harris might be the worst president in US history, but she's not going to alter the system so that she can rule forever and so that her friends can rule forever and divide everything between them. No matter what my GOP Republican friends might say, this is not what she's going to do. She might cause harm to the institutions that they cherish, but she will leave and someone else will come in. And so the process goes on. If Trump comes in, there's a real risk that that is the last free and fair election that takes place. He is of the mind, I think, to pervert and subvert the system to the benefit of himself, his friends, and unfortunately, his children. And then you've got sort of dynastic rule coming up. And his children, if anything, are less smart than he is, or at least Donald Trump Jr. is 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 less smart, but uh, has that uh, overwhelming sense of privilege. To, to people who say, oh, hang on a second, that's far-fetched. We just have to look at Hungary, Orban's Hungary. We just have to look at Yanukovych. We just, there are numerous examples, Georgia Dream. But and even the construction of the Georgian system. You no, know, but even if we take, sorry to interrupt you, but I just, I agree with you so much here. It's even if we take North Korea, dynastical rule, Kim Jong-un, right? Before him, it was his father. Before him, it was his grandfather. It's like this, it, we, we tend to think that this can't happen to us, but it can. I'm sure North Koreans did not think it was going to happen to them. I'm sure Hungarians didn't think it was going to happen to them. I mean, Russians have been living in this for centuries, so of course they 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 don't think it's happening to them now. <laughs> but um, but you know, pe people all over the world that are suffering, Fidel Castro in Cuba, people didn't think that was going to happen, right? And thankfully that got toppled. But imagine if it didn't. Like, look at how much damage yeah. that already caused, and Cuba is not the U.S. So the essence of democracy is: can you remove? a leader, whether they're good or bad, whether you support them or you don't, the mechanism to remove a leader and have a smooth transition of power to the legally elected uh, replacement, as it were, that's the essence of democracy, not the individual character that you, you vote for. And I think in the US, certainly, you know, partisan concerns mean that people have forgotten that that is the ultimate mechanism of democracy. Because over the stretch of a couple of hundred years, those individual personalities and the damage they can cause recede into insignificance. It's the transition inheritance of the system which is most important. Yeah, oh my God. You, like this story reminds me of Yanukovych so much. I agree with you 100%. It's when he built that freaking mansion uh, the size of a, a small town uh, that uh, I don't know could fit like half of my district in Kiev and uh, he was building all those undergrounds and buying stuff uh, because he believed that he will be ruling Ukraine forever but uh, like when we talked on a revolution when we talked about Yanukovych and uh, we were saying like dude he's mafioso and uh, he, like he has everybody police army everybody like there's no way we can overthrow yanukovych but the good news is that we could and uh, and everything is possible uh, the the only problem is that people will suffer um, again sometimes it's necessary unfortunately 
but uh, this is how it is. Uh, people in Ukraine since 2014, and I can talk about it because uh, I served uh, since uh, late 2014. Uh, people didn't really, be- not like didn't really believe, people forgot very, very fast that we had war in our country and like 700 away from Kyiv, there's like war with artillery, with tanks. And uh, eventually uh, this, uh, uh, the, the whole idea of defending Ukraine became desacralized. And uh, we, again, we had to learn the hard way how to be a society society, how a nation. Um, without Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine as a phenomenon, as uh, as a nation, uh, as, uh, as a country, as an international, I would say, event and phenomenon would never, would never emerge, I think. Um, that's why sometimes, unfortunately, it's necessary, even though the consequences can be absolutely devastating and horrifying. But in the end, um, I will tell you this. When Yanukovych was elected, and I feared, I feared this day, seriously. When Yanukovych was elected, you know, one day passed, I woke up the other day, and I saw that there's tomorrow and everything's fine. And then, you know, uh, he started like uh, beating up protesters and yada, yada. But there were, there was all tomorrow, always another opportunity to start something new, you know. Then the revolution came and we were hoping for this tomorrow and it would always come the next day. There was always tomorrow. And when the war came, there was always tomorrow so guys there was there will be always tomorrow when uh, we will be able to use our opportunities to change things we should believe uh, in this and we should be very very motivated that that is the main idea main main message of all of my videos we should be motivated well we should be motivated because you know humans adjust to everything right like if you think about it we at some point we start devaluing kind of like the amount of horrendous stuff that's happening to us right it's the same as like the headlines about ukraine when iran attacked israel with 100 missiles it made it on the headlines kiev gets attacked with 100 missiles every other day and it doesn't make it to the headlines because it's become the new normal for kiev kiev just lives like that right but it shouldn't be normal but the world got used to it people in kiev got used to it i sure got used to it you know i pick and choose when i go to the bomb shelter at this point based on the risk factor in my head girl math but you know and but so do most people and it's one of those things where if Trump gets elected, there is going to be a tomorrow, right? And he's going to start doing all of these changes and he's going to start kind of like uh, uh, bringing the world closer and closer to a complete collapse of, of the world as we know it. And we're not, and if we don't do anything about it, right, we're never going to do anything about it until it's too late. And then it's going to cost actual lives. It's going to cost actual, it's going to cost a lot. And I think that it's really upsetting to see this sort of transpire right now because we have not only a leader that we know wants to be in office forever and his children are awful and the dynasty is going to continue. We have his wife who is against him. We have half of his party that's against him because I was in DC two weeks ago and I've spoken to a plethora of Republicans that are not MAGA. None of them want him in office. None of them think he should be in office and none of them think he will be in office, thankfully, but that's, you know, that's just their opinion. But the point is that it's, it's you know, to the people who are considering voting for him or to the people who don't understand the issue because they're like, oh, well, Russia is not bad. You know, we, we hate Ukraine. It's not about Russia and Ukraine. What you're looking at is your president supporting a country that silences its people, your president supporting a country that pays people to kill people in a different country. It's like it doesn't matter whether you like Ukraine or you like Russia, whose side you like. You need to understand that the person you're voting for supports taking away freedoms and supports a person who notoriously takes the most freedoms away, probably in the world right now. So that should tell you something about the person you are voting for, because had they had your freedoms and your, uh, like, you know, the best uh, of you, the, the best intentions for you in mind, 
they would not be supporting someone who does not for their own citizens, who blackmails other countries by um, by detaining their citizens and making them prisoners of war somehow when they're journalists or nurses or visitors, you know, or just, uh, I don't want to say dumb, but um, um, let's say ignorant Westerners who decide to visit Russia during this period of time because they think it's such a great space and they become chess pieces. How is this not obvious that this is not a person you want to be there? Because even if it, even if he aligns with what you think you want today, that that's what if tomorrow you want something else and the president is supposed to reflect you, but so far he's not reflecting you, you're reflecting him. And that's a problem. And what Andre said, there's the, the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, some people will believe the story. Some people will think, hey, these guys are like us. You know, they believe in traditional values. They believe in the Christian ethics that we believe in. And I don't want to mock those because these people generally, you know, genuinely hold those beliefs and they may actually be extremely good people. They've just been sold a story. They've bought into a story which is entirely false. You can say it's naive, you could say it's ignorant, but actually these people are trusting, you know, they're used to dealing with other people in their lives who do not fabricate the entirety of reality for their own self-benefit. They are, it's almost like they don't have the immune system to cope with that. So what I see, you know, um, Andre and myself, uh, Anna from Ukraine and, and all the other guests that you've got on, we're we're building this immune system. We're we're developing the antibodies. The trouble is, it's mutating all the time. The pathogens are mutating all the time. So we've got to keep this thing going all the time. But we are, we are a medical experiment, a medical psychological experiment, um, and it's one I think the world is desperately in need of. You know, I will say that one thing that sort of gives me hope is, um, and this is to the topic of Trump, because of course he's he's the main topic at the moment of like the threats that the world has uh, other than Putin and I don't know, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but uh, there was an interview with him and it, it was an interview on a podcast because he decided to, you know, I, I guess appeal to Gen Z and younger audiences and go on a podcast. And the interviewer asked him a question, something about Democrats. And he said, well, I can't do that to them because I'm gen generally a truthful person. And the interviewer burst out laughing uncontrollably and and literally had to like ask the production to like kind of stop recording for a second because he could not hold. He just couldn't pretend. Right. And that's that is a great thing because that's we're finally seeing this where people are not willing to have the political correctness around him because it's a presidential candidate. So even when he lies, we don't fact check or even when he says something that is clearly utter uh, horse, you know, we're not going to say anything. And it's it's great to see that at least there are many more people in the world who who do not per se like persistently follow uh, Ukraine or Russia or, you know, Russian meddling in the American election or the American influence worldwide who are just sitting there and being like, I can't do this anymore. This is not, you know, he doesn't play by the rules. So I'm not going to play by the rules of journalism and just sit here and be like, okay, well, next question. No, it's like, no, no, you're not. You're not a truthful person. The whole point is that you constantly lie. <laughs> um there there's a lot of such people frankly yeah. speaking um and uh, i agree with jonathan here uh, we need to create some kind of Im immune system against uh, the brainwashing against the disinformation and uh, unfortunately it always happens uh, you know like it, it's classic uh, when the criminals are planning their crime and then they you know, conduct this crime, execute it, and then you as a law enforcement have to react somehow and then solve the, the results and everything else, find criminals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I like how they do, for example, in Germany, you know, when they, like, every single day they go, like, ISIS terrorist arrested, 
uh, he was preparing like a terrorist act in Köln. Uh, another terrorist arrested who was preparing a terrorist act like in, in another place. Uh, they do it prevent would you know uh, pre preemptively react to such things as hybrid warfare uh, because uh, hybrid warfare like didn't exist before we we only started to to learn how to uh, how to combat it and uh, we still have to learn a lot but uh, you know in a better world uh, we need to have this force that will react preemptively and uh you know strike in the heart of a dragon i'm i'm, I... I'm seeing a kind of marvel type uh you know disinformation avengers assemble kind of thing uh you me anna and a couple of other characters in weird costumes <laughs> I mean, that, that, you know, the Halloween is soon, so <laughs> we might as well do a Halloween flesh mob. But um, I think like a good summary of this, right, is if you're sitting somewhere anywhere around the world, right, and let's say you're bored and you there is like a leader or there is a piece of information that is so exciting, it almost feels like it's unreal. It's so exciting, right? There is a reason why it feels so unreal and why it feels so exciting. And if you feel if you think about your like the people that you are voting for, because right now the biggest danger in misinformation is that they're pushing people onto you, right? If you're sitting there and you're listening to these people and they excite you and all of this, right? And you start realizing that these people do not reflect what you have asked of them, but you start reflecting what they have asked of you. These are not democratic leaders. Because even if we look at Trump supporters, right? Like, okay, sure. It, Christians that don't like abortions, that like guns, and that don't like immigrants. Fine. That's his baseline, right? But then there is now hating the other parties, hating the other countries, hating specific immigrants. There is now narratives that uh, didn't exist that are starting to come into the picture. And it's not him repeating your narratives. It's you repeating his so when you start seeing in your information space that it's no longer something that you think that your leaders are acting upon, it's something they're telling you that you're acting upon, you now start representing the leaders. That's fascism and that's autocracy. When that's the leaders a, represent you, that's when we have democracy. And, and when those leaders don't feel capable to tell hard things. Now, this is difficult for elected politicians everywhere, but when they can no longer tell hard truths to their electorate and will just, I mean, the first stage is saying to the electorate things they want to believe, whether those things are true or not, whether they're possible or not. That goes a lot, a lot in politics. But when that becomes the norm, politics becomes degraded because you'll, you'll, you'll fall for the false promise. It doesn't happen. You'll be jaded, etc. There's a level beyond that. And of course, Putin has perfected this. It is understanding that there is trauma and resentment in your population. Then you use the genuine trauma and resentment and you create more of it. You also create imagined resentments that weren't even there before. Once you've got that, you've got people in a state of terror. You've got them in a state of envy and hatred. And then you can manipulate them. What I find challenging about Trump, actually, is that he's taken that playbook. He's adopted that playbook of real and imagined grievance, and he's united it with empty promises. And unfortunately, it's an extremely potent mixture. There were many Americans who were convinced by Hitler's rhetoric in the 1930s. And there were some classic propaganda films that tried to explain how this mechanism of weaponized grievance works. America had come out of, you know, the dust bomb, the Great Depression. There was plenty of grievance there. But a leader, a, a mature politician will say, look, things are bad. There's going to be a lot of hard work, but this is how we improve it. A tyrant, a would-be tyrant, is going to, is going to use that, uh, that grievance. Then when he gets into power... He's going to make sure that the grievance multiplies because the poor are going to get poorer, the downtrodden, more downtrodden, those who feel they've had things stolen from them, whether it's their cultural values or whatever. Well, of course, he's going to he's going to make that worse because that's how you perpetuate yourself as an autocrat. And this is the Putin playbook 101. 
Yeah, so, uh, I uh, I would like to add here, for example, uh, when uh, you are a strong leader and there's a problem, you need to find ways to you need to find uh, enough strength uh, and ways to motivate people and uh, solve the problem. If you a wanna be dictator, uh, you. Uh, even though the, there is like no obvious problem, you can create one and convince the voters that it's a problem. And then based uh, on hatred, you will uh, develop your uh, strategy, your your uh, all your campaign and stuff, your communication. Uh, the core principle here is when there are people who want to hurt you, they will never hurt you with positive information. They will always uh, introduce some negativity and they will never motivate you. They will always demotivate you with hatred, with uh, negativity, with fear. That's why always, always uh, our dear viewers should question negative information they receive. And they must always remind themselves every single day to be more positive and less toxic because positive people generally have better immunity against disinformation. Um, so I agree with all of this so, so wholeheartedly that there is hardly anything I can I can add, but how I think we can what we can do to sort of maybe further drill this information into people's heads right is both of you um in as little words as possible what do you think happens to the world if russia succeeds what do you think happens to the world if trump succeeds well, we've already uh, we've read george orwell it's a mashup yeah. between 1984 and brave new world it's a weird mixture of consumer surveillance totalitarianism in in my view in the end everything will be good or not 50 50 a 50 50 chance to continue to either live your life and you know no have a guarantee that everything's going to be okay because you've taken uh, out all the threats or you can just take a 50 50 chance you know where you're going to still have to do that at some point but if russia happens you don't have to worry for if russia wins you don't have to worry because nothing bad ever happened and they never committed any crimes and that wasn't real anyway so we'll right. be able to forget about all the bad stuff which is great right and it's like three generations after us are going to be sitting here not knowing anything about it. And Russia is just going to be the good guy who came and uh, and um, saved uh, Russian speaking Ukrainians. And that's how the United States became became a totalitarian state <laughs> because it was all biolabs at the end of the day. <laughs> it's fine. They'll clean up history. <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining me today, uh, you know, one more time. And I'm, of course always happy to have you here and hope that you will come back for more discussions like this and uh thank you for dedicating your time to this and i think that today out of all episodes this one might have been my favorite so far because i think we've delved into some really kind of actually red line topics on the internet and with cutting absolutely all fluff and political correctness and trying to get to people to get their thinking moving in terms of what you know what's happening and how big it really is so thank you for that thank you so thank much thank you be safe it's a pleasure <laughs> thanks so as per usual this was some very daring conversation and honestly this one today as i said to the guys earlier is probably one of my favorite ones and a very important one because we are not talking about it enough it is political speak and it is political correctness but this is not the time to be politically correct, and this is not the time to fluff things. We are at a verge of a very, very important historical shift, and we can either turn it in our favor or against us. So we need to be very responsible with all the information we consume and how we think about things. Well, if you enjoyed this talk and would like to hear more conversations like that, please don't forget to subscribe to UATV English and The Gaze. Also, do like this video, give it 
a comment and share it with a friend because maybe they will find it interesting too and share it with another friend. And I read all of your comments because I'm very interested in what you have to say. See you next time.